Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. Liturgically, the church does celebrate today the 18th Sunday after Trinity, and I will base my sermon this morning upon the gospel appointed for us, coming to us from the 22nd chapter of the gospel according to St. Matthew, and I will read to you that passage right now. Now, when the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David, he saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Set thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither does any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Here endeth the gospel. Praise be to thee, O Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. My dear friends in our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, setting the scene, setting the stage, so to speak of this passage we just heard coming to us from the 22nd chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel. St. Matthew tells us that when the, again, and where I began was from verse 34. And so in verse 34 it says, When the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had put the Sadducees to silence. Now bear in mind, dear friends, so we can keep in mind the context of what's going on here. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were, they were, they were all Jews, of course, and yet they were bitter rivals. They did not like each other. The Pharisees didn't like the Sadducees, and the Sadducees didn't like the Pharisees. So why was this? Well, first of all, again, the Pharisees to answer that question first in regards to them. The Pharisees were a religious party, if you will, among the Jews. And they considered themselves as sorts to be separatist. In other words, they were elitist. They believed that nobody, and I mean nobody, observed the law, the Mosaic law, like they did. And so, again, they had different beliefs than the Sadducees as well. For example, the Pharisees believed in immortality of the body, and they believed in, again, spiritual beings such as angels. Now, contrast this with the Sadducees. The Sadducees themselves were also a party of sorts within Judaism, and yet the Sadducees mostly were descended from, <coughs> excuse me, the high priest. <coughs> and as a result, they were sort of, they considered themselves to be Jewish aristocracy, so to speak, royalty within Judaism. And so they were bitter rivals of the Pharisees. And again, as I stated, they both had, <coughs> excuse me, they both had similar beliefs as Jews, but there were certain things that they did not hold in common. 
the Sadducees, for example, didn't believe in immortality of the body, and they didn't believe in they don't believe in spiritual beings such as angels. And so that's the context of what we see here in verse 34. In other words, the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had put the Sadducees to silence. So you see, the Pharisees jumped at this opportunity. The Pharisees jumped at this chance. Because not only did they want to silence our blessed Savior, because they saw how popular he was getting to be with all the general population, all the people that were following our blessed Savior, all the people that were coming after our blessed Savior, all the people that were following our blessed Savior, they saw this as a big problem. So they wanted to take this opportunity to do what they could to silence him. But there was also a secondary opportunity that they wanted to jump on was because they saw that, again, if our blessed Lord had silenced the Sadducees, but they, the Pharisees, were able to outwit our blessed Savior, so to speak, they would be able to look wonderful in the eyes of all the Jewish people. And so they sent a lawyer. Now remember, again, in this context, when it says lawyer, in our 20th century, 21st century mindset, most of us, including myself, when we hear that term lawyer, we, we think of Perry Mason, we think of somebody that's defending us in a court of law. No, in this case, a lawyer or a scribe would be someone who is well-versed and authority in the Mosaic law. And so they sent their lawyer, the Pharisees did, they sent one of their lawyers, one of their again, authorities in the law to our blessed Savior to question him. And the lawyer asked him, which is the greatest law? Which is the greatest commandment? And it says here, St. Matthew tells us that this lawyer was tempting him. Now, as it sounds like, yes, he was trying him. He was testing him. He was trying to ensnare our blessed Savior in a trap to see what he would say. But bear in mind, he was also trying to find out which law was the greatest. Because again, there were over 600 precepts of the Mosaic Law that faithful Jews were required to follow. And so this is what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and like-minded folk, that's what they did. They sat around and they discussed all these different Mosaic Laws. What ifs? And how about this scenario? And what about this example? And they discussed all of these things. Well, when the lawyer asked our blessed Lord, what, in your opinion, is the greatest commandment? Our Lord didn't miss a beat. Our Lord immediately replied with the what's known as the Shema. All Jews would know this. Even the little Jewish school children would know this answer. And our Lord again stated, he was quoting scripture. In this case, he was quoting the Old Testament, obviously. The first part, he was quoting Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 5, which says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And then he went on, and the second he quoted is like unto it. And then he quoted Old Testament book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18, where it says, 
but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, dear friends, what our Lord is saying, that these two commandments, if you will, are the foundation upon which everything else is built upon. And one is related to the other. Now, how is that? Well, first and foremost, our Lord is saying that, firstly, we are always to love God, first and foremost. We are to make God number one priority in our lives. So often, dear friends, and I say this so often during my sermons because it's so true. And I know this from my own experience as well as you do. But so often we make human beings or we make, we make material things of this world or we make worldly tre treasures or trinkets or doodads, whatever you want to refer to them as. We make these things, we make these items first and foremost in our mind and in our heart. When we should really be making God our Heavenly Father first and foremost. We are called to love God first and foremost before all else. But you notice that again, our blessed Lord, when he was answering the Pharisee, when he was answering the lawyer, didn't miss a beat. And he did not hesitate when he followed up and said, and the second is like unto it. When he was quoting Leviticus, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Why did he say it that way? Because again, dear, my, dear friends, we always have to remember that God has created each and every one of us. He's created you. He's created me. He's created everyone throughout the world. All human beings are created in the image and the likeness of God. Again, Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 says, And God said, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. What does that mean? Quite frankly, despite the fact that our blessed Lord, yes, came to earth as a human being, he took human, took on human flesh. Despite that fact, and despite very often you'll see portrayals and famous pictures or holy cards or what have you. It'll picture God as our Heavenly Father as an old man with a long flowing white beard or it'll picture the Holy Ghost as a dove. Despite those portrayals, God is not a physical being like you and I. He doesn't have hair nor does he have a body or arms or legs. So what does it mean, let us make man in our image? Well, if we look at Old Testament Book of Wisdom, chapter 2, verse 23, we hear the following. For God created man to be immortal and made him to be an image of his own eternity. This brings us full circle back again to our blessed Savior. Because God sent his only son into the world in the image of a man, if you will, so that he could save us, you and me, all humanity, so that he could save us from our sins. You see, because through sin, we were limiting ourselves. We were holding ourselves back, if you will. 
we were not able to spend eternity in the presence of God. And so our blessed Lord sent his only son to the world to die on the cross so that he could save us from our sins. A feat, an accomplishment that you and I, none of us, could ever hope to again to ever achieve by our own works, by ourselves. God did it for us by dying on the cross to save us from our sins and then being raised to new life, thus defeating death on the third day, that original Easter morn. This is why we should always focus on the fact that we are called to love, as our blessed Lord said, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so often we don't do that. Why? Because we're so self-centered, we're so egocentric, we're always focusing on us. And also, it's easier to focus on the faults of others, the sins of others, the shortcomings of others. It's easier as to focus on those things. Why? Because then if I'm focused on your shortcomings and what you've done wrong, I don't have time to focus on what I've done wrong, my sin. St. James again says it perfectly. St. James chapter 3, verse 9 states, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we man, which are made after the similitude of God. What is St. James referring to right here? He is referring to our tongue, our mouth. What St. James is trying to point out, with the same tongue wherewith you praise God, and you glorify God, and you tell the wonders of God, it's with the same tongue that you also put down your neighbor and curse your neighbor and say wrong things about your neighbor. St. James is saying, how can this be? How can both blessings and curses come from your same mouth? This is why, again, we always have to remember our Lord's words. To, first of all, to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And then, remember to love our neighbor as ourself. Because all of us, you, me, everybody, we are made in the likeness of God. And God loves each and every one of us. So this day, dear friends, continue to love God, continue to make him number one in life, and continue to love your fellow man more and more and more. That way you honor God. You honor the likeness of God in all of our neighbors. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. God bless you, dear friends.